Hi everyone, welcome back. I am Dr. Derek Lindquist. I am the Dean of the Jindal School of Psychology and Counseling at OP Jindal Global University. And I'm happy to welcome you to our seventh episode of Mining the Mind. Now at this point, I think it's gonna be valuable to do a little deeper dive into neuronal function. So I think everyone at this point understands that neurons are what we call the basic functional unit of the uh, brain. This is really where the, the most important stuff is happening. And this is true not just for the brain, but the nervous system in general, including the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. And when we look at the neuron, the thing I really want to focus in on at this moment is the membrane. Now, the membrane is what covers the neuron, right? It's very similar to your skin. It keeps the inside of the neuron uh, distinct and separate from the outside. And the membrane is composed of this lipid bilayer. Lipid just means fat, okay? But the important part here is that molecules cannot flow directly back and forth across that membrane. Rather, there must be channels and receptors. Think of just kind of a hollow tube. Channels and receptors have to be embedded within the membrane. It's only through these channels and receptors then that molecules can flow into or out of the neuron itself. Important idea that we'll come back to here in just a moment. Now, when we look at the electrical properties of a neuron, a lot of these ideas go all the way back to the 1930s and 40s. It was discovered that this so-called giant squid had really big neurons. So big, in fact, that you could see parts of them with the naked eye. Okay? So neuroscientists of the day, they took out a little segment of the neuron, and they wanted to look at, again, this electrical distribution or the electrical charge of neurons. So the terms that we use are potential, voltage, or electrical charge. There are slight differences between all three terms, but for our purposes, they largely mean the same thing. So how did they do this? Well, they use something called a voltmeter, right? It measures voltage. So when they take the two leads of the voltmeter and they place them both within the fluid, within the Petri dish that contains the neuron segment, well, there's no difference in electrical charge between those two leads, so we see an output of zero. Not unexpected. But if you take one lead and keep it in the solution and the other lead you place inside of the neuron, now we find that the inside of the neuron is electrically negative relative to the outside. And in fact, this seems to be the case for virtually every neuron that we have recorded from. So in this case, the inside is about negative 70 millivolts more negative. Now, if you don't know what a millivolt is, don't worry about it. It's just a metric like meter, right? It just means that the inside, again, is electrically ne negative relative to the outside. So this is the important part. So what contributes to that negative interior? Well, part of it is the distribution of ions. An ion is just a molecule with an electrical charge. Okay? We have cations, which have a positive charge. We have anions, which have a negative charge. So one way that a neuron is electrically negative is that it has more negatively charged molecules or ions on its interior, inside of it. And in fact, when we look at these ions, there's three in particular that we're going to focus on. These are what's largely responsible for this difference in electrical charge. So first, we have sodium. Abbreviation is Na+. That plus sign tells us it's a positively charged ion. So this number here shows us the concentration outside the cell versus inside the cell, or the neuron. So what we find is there is significantly more, almost 10 times as much sodium outside the neuron than inside the neuron. If we look at potassium, abbreviation K+, so again, another positively charged ion, we find is 400 inside versus 20 outside. So almost 20 times as much potassium inside the cell or the neuron than outside. Finally, we have chloride, Cl-. This is a negatively charged ion. So outside 560, inside 150. So once again, there's more chloride outside the cell than inside the cell. Now, we can actually graph this over here on the right or the left, as the case may be, right? So here's the intracellular. This is inside the neuron. We have high levels of potassium, low levels of sodium and chloride. In the extracellular space, in between the neurons, we have low levels of potassium, but high levels of sodium and chloride. What is sodium chloride? It's salt, right? So I say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but the idea is all terrestrial life, all life on the land, 
You know, in the ancient past, we emerged out of the oceans. We emerged out of the sea. And in some respects, we still carry that seawater around with us inside of our head. So what's responsible for this distribution, this uneven distribution of ions with respect to the neuron? Well, it really comes down to two forces, the diffusion force and the electrical force. So first, I love my coffee. I have a couple of cups every single morning. I put a little bit of cream in there, and what does the cream do? It diffuses throughout the entire cup of coffee, right? This is called the diffusion force. It means that any compound, if there's an area of high concentration and it can move to an area of low concentration, it will always move down its concentration gradient. So again, in the video here, you can see you put a little bit of food dye at the top of the water, and just like the cream, it's going to spread throughout the entirety of that cup. Okay? So this is our first force, the diffusion force. Molecules move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. Secondly, we have the electrical force. And here, the important concept is what we see with magnets. So the most important part here is the electrical force. Now here, we're going to refer back to magnets. I think everybody knows that ultimately, opposite charges attract, whereas same charges repel each other. Well, the same is true for ions, and the same is true for areas of electrical activity. And remember, the inside of the neuron is always negative. So what we find is that when we look at ions, alike charges, two positive ions are going to repel, whereas opposite charges would attract. Okay? That's the idea. Now, the last point I just want to reiterate, which is, again, molecules cannot move back and forth directly across the membrane. They always have to depend upon these channels and receptors, which are specific for specific types of ions. We call this selective permeability. So one channel may emit sodium, whereas another channel will only emit potassium. All right, so let's begin to put this together. Here we have a box. We have high levels of sodium on the right. That's what the big NA means low levels of sodium on the left, and an impermeable barrier here in the middle. Now we put a channel, right? That a channel allows sodium to flow back and forth. So sodium is going to move from the area of high concentration down its concentration gradient to the area of low concentration. And over time, as that electrical charge moves, as that positive ion moves into the interior, the positive charge is going to build up until ultimately it reaches what we call equilibrium. There's really no net difference into or out of the neuron at that point. All right, so let's begin to put this together, okay? So based on the diffusion force and the electrical force, if we know the charge, positive or negative, and the concentration of any single ion, we should be able to predict whether that ion will move in or out of the cell. So let's start with sodium, right? And the, for those of you watching, if you want to pause your video and try to figure this out yourself, feel free. So here's the idea. Sodium is a positive charge. And we know based on our concentration gradient, and again, there's almost 10 times as much sodium outside the cell than inside. So first, diffusion. There's more outside than inside. So if we open a channel specific to sodium, the diffusion force, force is going to push sodium into the cell, into the neuron. Sodium is a positive ion. The inside of the neuron is negative, which means that positive ion is attracted to the negative interior. So the electrical force is also going to push sodium to the inside. So in this case, both the electrical force and the diffusion force are pushing in the same direction. They're pushing sodium into the interior of the cell. Now, sodium is a positive ion. The inside is negative, right? Negative 70. So as more and more positive ions flow in, the interior becomes less negative over time. So in other words, we go from negative 70 to negative 68, negative 66, et cetera. Okay. Potassium, K plus, okay, positive ion. And once again, we know that there's about 20 times as much potassium inside than outside. So if we open a channel specific to potassium, the diffusion force is going to push it out of the neuron, out of the cell. Okay. But it's a positive ion, which is attracted to the negative interior of the neuron. So the electrical force is going to push it in. So now in this case, we have these two contrary forces. 
we have the electrical force pushing it in and the diffusion force pushing it out. Now at this point, you'll just have to trust me when I tell you the diffusion force is stronger. Okay? So ultimately, if we open up a channel for potassium, more potassium will flow out of the cell. And as a result, it's going to take that positive charge with it. So if you take away negative, or excuse me, if you take away positive charge, K plus, right, then the interior becomes more and more negative over time. Negative 70 to negative 72, et cetera. Our last one is chloride, right? Negative. So we know it's a negatively charged ion. We know that there is more chloride outside than inside. So once again, if we open up a channel specific to chloride, what we find is that the diffusion force is going to push chloride into the cell, but it's a negative ion which is repelled by the negative interior. So it's attracted to the positive outside. It wants to flow out. So the electrical force is going to push it out of the neuron. Right? Contradiction. But again, we know that the diffusion force is stronger overall. So if we open a channel for chloride, chloride is going to flow more in than out. So as that negative charge moves in, that negative ion moves into the cell, the interior becomes more and more negative. Negative 70, negative 72, et cetera. That's it. This is how these ions move back and forth across the membrane. Diffusion force and electrical force. And through these processes, the neuron can maintain this difference in electrical charge, where the inside is always negative relative to the outside. But there is a conundrum. Over time, if you have more sodium flowing in and more potassium flowing out, eventually that cell interior is going to become less negative or more positive. So how do you maintain that charge differential? Neurons use pumps. These are really going to deplete a lot of the cell's energy, but they're critical for main maintaining these concentration gradients. So in this case, we have a sodium-potassium pump. It takes three sodium ions, and through the use of ATP or energy, it pushes the sodium out of the cell. It then latches on to potass potassium, and it can move two potassiums into the cell. So it's pushing sodium out, it's bringing potassium in. This is how those concentration gradients are maintained. Okay? But again, it uses this ATP that's required for these pumps is almost 40% of a cell's energy expenditure. So very costly, but very important for the cell's function. All right, that's it. If you've been with me so far, we've talked about these electrical forces and diffusion forces and how they contribute to the electrical properties of neurons. When I see you again, we're going to talk about how that contributes to the generation of an action potential. Thank you.